You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Vyadaris, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. You, you feel this this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Packernet After Dark. This is the call-in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to call in, participate, you can do so at 608-501-0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line, and we do have a new caller today, so why don't we go ahead and get started with that. What's up, Ryan? This is Austin Kelly out of West Georgia. I've been a long-time listener, huge fan of your show. And Thank you. Work. Probably should have called in sooner, but here I am, and I'm actually probably going to do one more after this. Uh, Two. Send this in and do one more. But anyway, let's get straight to it. So, the thing that has been bothering me so much about Twitter, and I know you've mentioned it on your podcast, um, that bothers me so much is people are losing their minds about moving on from Aaron Rodgers. And I get it. Like, you know, I'm a Packers fan. I've been born and raised. And, and by the way, the, the gaslighting for me is, is the crazy part. Right? So, I, I'll go on Twitter. And, for example, I was really excited that Jordan Love is working out with his guys. I've been saying for years that we've needed a guy to do this, and he's doing it, and it's awesome. And so what happens is people who are big-time Rodgers guys will attack the living crap out of you and will tell you that working out with people early has no bearing whatsoever, literally zero bearing whatsoever, is, is what I'm being told currently in my discussions on Twitter. Zero correlation between effort, practice, um, working out with your guys, and success on the football field. And the only reason I'm saying that there is is because I hate Rodgers so much. And again, the, the crazy thing about that is Everything I'm saying is perfectly rational and does not come from a place... uh, Certainly frustration that Rodgers didn't do this. Not hatred of Rodgers, but a lot of frustration that he would not do this. Because as much as everybody's upset about the missed opportunities, because Brian Gutekunst didn't draft another a third wide receiver or whatever, um, yeah, I'm, I'm also upset about missed opportunities, and this is a big one. But again, the gaslighting occurs because these are people who are defending nonsense... Because they have to defend everything about Aaron Rodgers. And then are saying to me that I'm the one that's acting in defense or or out of pure blind hatred. It is 100% opposite. It's the same with the Pat McAfee thing. Pat McAfee did a bad thing. I said he did a bad thing. People lost their minds and attacked me and said, I did, I'm doing this just because I hate Rodgers so much. Bro, you are out of your freaking mind. And the only reason you are in my comments right now is because you have lost your freaking mind and are just on an absolute mission from God in heaven above to attack every single human being you come across that says anything that might even slightly imply that Rogers is not the greatest human being on planet Earth. It is a complete 180 from what they're trying to portray on Twitter. They are absolutely unhinged in their defense of of every single thing that Aaron Rodgers has ever done, 
and are trying to convince people that they're just out trying to defend a man from unabashed hatred. And it's completely one on 180% the opposite. I've, I've had the luxury of watching two Hall of Fame quarterbacks play. Here's the problem that no one really talks about. What, what were the Packers going to do with Aaron Rodgers this year? Nothing. Right. They were not going to accomplish anything right. if, he, if he came back. Was- hey, I, I hate to keep cutting you off. New caller. Appreciate it. Please keep calling in. Sorry that I'm obnoxious this way. But you say, and, and this is what I love about the show, you say stuff and it sparks things in my brain. I want you to make the best possible case for me that we're going to make the playoffs. I think that's a really tough ask. Because uh, even if you are a big Aaron Rodgers person, you want him to come back and all that stuff, you have been, over the last, I don't know how many weeks, explaining to me how the coach is incompetent, the roster is is garbage, our receivers are garbage, our tight ends are garbage, our offensive line is garbage, our defense is garbage, our defensive coordinator is garbage, our GM is garbage. So you go ahead and explain to me why we need to spend $100 million over three years, which is what it's going to cost. We'll talk about that tomorrow. $100 million over three years in cap space to bring back Aaron Rodgers for one year because we're going to apparently get into the playoffs. Just paint that picture for me. We're going to get into the playoffs. And by the way, keep in mind, you hate everything about this team not named Aaron Rodgers. Maybe Aaron Jones and a couple other pieces you like. But everybody else, no faith whatsoever. So what's the point? I don't understand it. It's not going to change a thing. They were not going to probably make, if they make the playoffs, sure, the NFC sucks. You can make the argument that I get sick of hearing, oh, you have Aaron Rodgers, you always have a chance. Well, watching all the years that I've watched, there's been several times where we have all been disappointed, right. thinking, scratching our head, going, why did we not, you know, get further than what we did? So, yeah. given that might be the case, look, no one wants to move on from a Hall of Fame quarterback. No one, it sucks. Right. And, and again, my point had been, if Aaron Rodgers was 30 years old and was going to be playing for the next 10 years, th- this would not be a question. And yes, I would also be saying, why in the world did you draft Jordan Love? That was stupid, right? He's not 30. He's basically 40, and he's was just about to retire prior to the whole thing. So, yeah, I, I don't want to move on from Rodgers because I hate Rodgers. That's so stupid. It's, it's just, it's time to move on. It's scary. It's, it's not fun. But here's the thing that really a lot of, I guess, realists, which you 100% are, Thank so you. I can't wait to hear what you say about this, they don't like talking about that. I said it last year when they lost to the 49ers in embarrassing fashion in the, in the playoffs. It, it's time. It's time. Yeah. You can't hold on to that forever because if you hold on to Aaron too long, then you lose out on an opportunity to, to get another quarterback. You end up like the Saints. You end up like what the Bucks are going to do, okay? And the Packers don't operate that way. Now, now if you look back and you go, the Packers probably could have done some more things to get that Super Bowl, for sure. But I, I tell you, it is, it, it's hard time and time again to watch them go to the playoffs and they just and they just stink it up, man. It's yeah. like they get there, they look great, and then something just falls apart. And they suck, and I, or they don't suck, but they just they screw it all up and they and they lose. No, they kind of suck. Like, Let, let's be completely honest. They kind of suck, and that is the disappointment. You know, it was back in 2020. Even you can go back even further. You can go back 2019. You can go back a lot of the different years, but 2020 was the sort of the pivot point for me. Not not that I wanted to get rid of Rogers. That honestly didn't really occur to me. I didn't really want to go there. I didn't think it was fair to blame. And I know you're not blaming Rogers for everything, but it was like you know. I don't want to put it all on Rodgers. I wasn't to that point. It wasn't really even on my radar. I mean, it was a little bit because, again, I've been trying to work through, like, when is this transition going to happen? But freaking guy won MVP. Like, it wasn't really on my mind. But 2020 was was a really pivotal year for me, and I'm guessing a lot of other people because that was such a freaking good football team. I know special teams was a disaster, but that was such an unbelievably good football team. They were dominant. And it wasn't just that they lost, and it's like, well, if we're that good and still lose, then there's no hope, which is kind of the point. But it wasn't just that. It was the fact that they weren't a good football team in that game. 
We're talking number one offense in all of football. They played like garbage. They played like garbage, and and it was not the first time we've seen that, and it wouldn't be the last. They're going to do it the next year, and then the next year after that, they're going to lose to the Lions playing like garbage. I mean, in pivotal moments, the team just does not show up. And my big question after 2020 was, what do you do? What is the answer? Again, this is why I, I can't stand the whole Gutekunst thing, you know, why that annoys me so much, because players aren't the answer. It doesn't matter how many players we add. It doesn't matter how good the team is. What, we're going to go from 13 wins to 14 wins to 15 wins to, to 17 wins in a season and then get knocked out the first round of the playoffs? It's not about better players. The question that we're, we're just completely ignoring is why is it our team goes to zero? I mean, again, if you go back to like thinking about it in terms of Madden ratings, like we had a, a 92 overall graded team in Madden. And we lost in the playoffs, and the thought is, well, it's because we were at a 92. We should have been at a 97. If we had a drafted T. Higgins, we would have been a 90, uh, probably more like a 94, maybe. I doubt it goes up much more than that. And if we were a 94, then we would have won. But you're missing it. Because, yes, a 94 would have won. But here's the thing. A 92 would have beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, too. The problem isn't that a 92 isn't enough. The problem is they went from a 92 team down to a 62 team and got the crap kicked out of them and got embarrassed. The question is, what do we do about that? And again, kind of talk about it a little bit tomorrow in terms of, I can't, with a straight face, 100% tell you that I know that Aaron Rodgers is the reason for all of this. But I, I agree with you that we just have to try something else. You know, I mean, we can't just keep running it back, run it back, run it back, run it back. Like, you know, at some point, it's like, what, what, is, what is the point of this? Like, let's just stop for a second and ask, why? Why do we want to run this back? I mean, again, winning a lot of regular season games is cool and all that, except for, the, and, and 2022 was the absolute breaking point, because even people like me were like, hey, win regular season, lose in the postseason, I can get over it. Although it's still kind of like, as somebody who likes to analyze and, and fix things, how do we fix it? It's still a question. But when 2022 happens and you don't even make the playoffs, now there's nothing. Now there's nothing for me to sink my teeth into and say, run it back or keep Rodgers or do anything like that. It's like, we, we need to go in a new direction. That doesn't mean Jordan Love is the answer. It doesn't mean any of that. But we've tried the same, you know, the, the same approach, same coach, same quarterback, same scheme, same locker room dynamics, same leaders, all that stuff. And by leaders, I mean leader and I mean Aaron Rodgers. And by really breaking that, and really, the team is largely the same, but Aaron Rodgers is such a massive force in what he does for this team. The fact of the matter is, I mean, it, it's he he really does make up a massive a part uh, a part of what this team is. And so, when we look at what's going wrong, it's hard to look at it and go, "Well, it's not Rodgers, dude. It's not just his play. It's it's how he interacts with his players. It's the locker room dynamics. It's the scheme." It's the preparation, the expectations, and, and all these different things. It's all Aaron Rodgers. He sets the tone for every single thing. He is above Matt LaFleur, and I don't think there's a single person that would deny that. Not that that's a good thing, but Matt LaFleur is subservient to Aaron Rodgers. Like, that, that, that's the thing. And so, yeah, when we get to this point, and by the way, again, even Gutekunst bowed the knee to Aaron Rodgers and gave him the money. It's like, okay, you get what you want. You get your players, you get the money. Matt LaFleur bowed the knee. The whole team bowed the knee to Aaron Rodgers. And you know what? It didn't work. We lost. We failed. And so you want to talk about accountability and responsibility, aside from the part where we can directly see the problems. We see the throws that are like, what the heck was that? We see the lack of throws, like throw the freaking ball. But aside from that, it's like you are the king of this team. You are the largest planet in this solar system. How can we discuss moving in a different direction but keeping you? We can't change anything. We can't change the scheme. We can't change the locker room dynamics. We and that's really the biggest thing. It's the team not believing in itself, not being prepared, not having the energy. Getting a new coach isn't necessary. I mean, maybe it will if you get somebody in there that's just a freaking hammer, but he's just going to collide with Rodgers, and either Rodgers is going to leave or he's going to break this coach down. The man, like, what is it going to take? Like, at some point, you've got to just grab this whole thing by the balls and just say, you know what, man, it's probably not going to happen. It is what it right. is. It sucks. We're going to look back on this now more than ever that he's gone, and it's going to suck because you're going to look at this and maybe have like a, I don't know, you're going to question yourself and say, did we waste it? Did right. we do enough? I don't know. I guess the point of what I'm trying to say is, 
Let's continue here. Uh, and, and again, you're, you're right about that. And we are going to look back and say, did we waste it? And the answer is yes. But in what way did we waste it? Um, and again, I don't know that I'm ever really going to fully get an answer to that. All, all I can do is continue to look at that Robert Tunyon thing where he said, you know, we get into the playoffs and we just kind of give up. We as in players. So again, I, I, this is why I struggle so much with the Gutekunst thing, not because I lick the bottom of his shoe, but it's hard for me to blame Gutekunst when he built a team that can dominate the regular season, can just eviscerate teams, win 13 games with no problem whatsoever, win the North, get the number one seed in the playoffs, and then the players admit that they gave up, they didn't show up, they didn't have the energy, they didn't have the belief. That's not the that's not the GM's job. I'm sorry to tell you. Sorry, that was so long winded. I'll, All good. I'll finish it up now. So, what I'm trying to say is, is do you think it was time? Do you think they should have done it a year or so ago? Do you think that? The Packers did enough, I guess, because I tell my friends all the time, because I live in Georgia and they're Falcons fans, and they say, oh, man, I, I just can't believe y'all are moving on from it. I'm like, oh, I'm like, what do you want them to do? Right. Like, I'm going to be honest. Well, and, and to be fair, and you would probably know better living in, in I don't want to say enemy territory, but in a place like that, but I really just think it's, it's, it's kind of an ignorance to the situation. You know, I mean, they think, Kind of the same way a lot of the the pro Rogers Packer fans think in, in just very basic terms. He's the greatest of all time. Your whole team is propped up by this guy, and you're moving on. So now you're now you're doomed. Like it's it's super simplistic. And I would assume, like maybe we'll find out in a second here. I would assume if you give them some basic tidbits of information and ask questions like that, like what 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 would you suggest? Um, you'd probably get some better responses. It's the way they went about the off season last season. I thought it was ridiculous. I'm like, listen, you know that Aaron Rodgers is going probably next year or the year after, yeah. minimum. And they, they attacked it the way they did. And they it didn't work. It yeah. did terrible. Yeah. The Chiefs did it, and it worked out for them. But that's a story for another day. But the Packers did something that they shouldn't have done all along. Aaron Rodgers was reaching a point in his career where he needed to be surrounded by as many people as possible that's going to help them over the opposite of what he's done in years past, where he's carrying them more than what I'm trying to explain to you now. Well, and, and that's been a major point that I've been trying to make also. Uh, again, a lot of the sort of Rodgers defenders will constantly talk about these holes. And it doesn't, like, I'll, I'll list 17 different things that worked in his favor, and they'll be like, well, what about special teams? And then you talk about, well, what in this year he had special, well, uh, okay, but he didn't have Devontae in that year. And it's like, how many freaking things does this guy need in order to succeed, right? I mean, you can't say that he, this is a guy who puts the team on his back, but at the same time, he needs to be carried. It's going to be a really ugly-looking thing while, you know, Aaron Rodgers is uh, trying to be carried by people who are trying to be carried by Aaron Rodgers, just a bunch of fish flopping on the ground, right? It's not really going anywhere. Either he's worth the money, and he can put the team on his back, and make up some of those deficiencies, or he can't. And if he can't, there's plenty of guys out there that can throw a football um, in a mediocre fashion who have no interest in participating in OTAs, who have no interest in putting in any extra work with uh, the rest of the guys to get up to speed with them, who uh, have no real ability to put their team on their back and overcome adversity and all that kind of stuff, and they don't cost as much as Aaron Rodgers does. So, you know, if, if that's kind of where we're at, then, yeah, it's time to move on. And in terms of what you're asking, should we have done this earlier? The answer is probably yes. Um, I think this is that this whole quarterback thing is. I don't want to say a debacle because if Aaron, if if Jordan Love ends up being a good quarterback, then every you know all is forgiven. But this whole thing has been kind of a mess, and um, it's. But but at the same time, it's understandable why Gutekunst did what he did at each moment, right? Drafting Jordan Love makes sense if you look at the information prior to drafting Jordan Love. Signing Aaron Rodgers makes sense, kind of, if you look at the information prior to back-to-back -back MVPs, right? But moving forward, like drafting Jordan Love and then looking after when he won MVP, it's like, ooh, yikes. Maybe. We'll see, right? It still works out if he's a great quarterback. Uh, you know, uh, giving Rodgers the extension, realizing that he's going to completely crap the bed and then try to retire the next year is, again, yikes.
So, I mean, it's just been uh, kind of a disaster, and I'm ready for this thing to normalize. And, yeah, he, he needs a couple things to break his way in order for this to not be... Again, th- there's a difference between making bad decisions and things just going completely like, how the heck could you have anticipated this? I mean, the MVP thing is hard to anticipate. I think you're probably right that you maybe should have been able to see, even if he's great, like you said, you know he's going to be out the door soon. So that's that's one of the more critical things of Gutekunst, in my mind, was giving him that contract. I thought he did a great job of not flinching and saying, no, we're not doing any of this. Um, and it, it kind of feels as though he maybe caved to pressure. I don't think he really liked Rodgers very much. I, I don't. I, I have a feeling the team was ready. But also you got to factor in Jordan Love hadn't really looked all that great either. So you move on from Aaron Rodgers. He goes and wins another MVP for another team while Jordan Love craps the bed for Green Bay. How's that going to make you look? I mean, it's it's an excuse, but it certainly is an understandable one. So, I mean, you know, all's well and ends well if we get some good compensation from Rodgers in the end and Jordan Love ends up being a good quarterback, or at least if he can find a good quarterback. But, yeah, this has been a bit of a uh, a whirlwind. So, I guess I'd like to know what you think about, you know, the Packers making the right decision here yeah. in, in moving on. Because I, don't, I, I firmly believe that there's nothing they could have done. Like, People are like, they, they, they should have kept him. They should have tried again. Blah, blah, blah. You don't move on from a guy like that. What were they going to do? Their roster is not good enough right now with the Packers or for him to be with the Packers and go win a Super Bowl. That opportunity sailed in 2020 and 2021. They shouldn't have done it last year, but they did. And now look at them. Looks a whole lot worse. And I get it. Stipulations are a little different. But anyways, I guess I'd like to know how you feel about how the Packers kept him or if they would have kept him this year, what they would have done because I'll bet they'd have done anything. Anyways, thanks. Yeah, so I don't want to give too much away because literally tomorrow's podcast is over an hour long of me laying out exactly my case for why I feel that it is time to move on. And and it seems ridiculous because it's like you've made that case a thousand times. Well, I wanted to make an attempt to, first of all, dispel some of the myths or some of the the arguments that get made in my place, right? This is why people want to move on. No, no, no. That's all garbage. And then point by point, issue by issue, here is the reality of how I feel and why I feel it. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But don't, quote from tomorrow, don't go listen to Ty Schmidt about why I believe what I believe. Listen to me about why I believe what I believe. Don't listen to his straw man nonsense. But yes, to answer your question, at least in some form, um, I think it's time to move on. I agree for, for every possible reason. I don't think we would have done a ton with Rodgers. I don't see a point in running what we did last year back. I don't see any reason um, to pay Aaron Rodgers, as I said, about $100 million, I believe, in cap space over three years is what it's going to cost us. It'd be you know the 30 or whatever he has this year. And then if he retires next year, it's about $70 million that would be split over two years. So three years, $100 million against the cap is what it would cost for him to come back and for us to miss the playoffs with him again. That does not seem like a fantastic plan, in my opinion. Essentially paying about 35, 30 to $35 million a year over three years to get one more year of Aaron Rodgers. No, it's, uh, it's time to move on. He wanted to retire. He doesn't want to play anymore. He made that clear. Now he wants to go for the Jets because he's, he's ticked off. Congratulations, go do that. We need to figure out something new. We need to try to record, re- replot this course a little bit and uh, see if we can kind of build a different culture, which, um, again, as we'll talk about a little bit tomorrow, but we, it was news today. Uh, part of that culture building that I'm excited about uh, has something to do with Jordan Love reaching out to his teammates and asking if they'd be willing to fly out to California to work with him. And uh, Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, and Aaron Jones are all out in California right now working out with Jordan Love, and I love that. Now, again, the people who get mad because they think I'm just attacking Aaron Rodgers with that news are saying, well, it's only because Jordan Love needs the extra help. Uh, first of all, that's entirely untrue. You can do that in OTAs. You don't have to do that in March. That's number one. This isn't about what you need to do. It's about doing more than what's required of you, which is the exact point of the conversation. Going above and beyond. You want to be the greatest in the entire world at something. And I got people on Twitter asking me, it's March, bro, who cares? The greatest in the world. 
one quarterback this year is going to hold up the trophy. One person on planet Earth out of billions of human beings is going to be able to hold that trophy over their head. One. 31 other teams loaded with talent trying to stop you from doing it. What are you going to do to overcome them? What are you going to do above and beyond what everybody else is already doing? Everybody's doing OTAs. Everybody's doing mini camps. Everybody's got a preseason, a week one, two, three, four, five, etc. What are you doing above and beyond? Scoffing at the idea of working out in March, which is hilarious because it really reminds me of scoffing at the idea that he even needs to show up to OTAs, or scoffing at the idea that he would even need to to hang out with his uh, his his rookie receiver. Everything is just scoffing. Ugh. Who cares? Who cares? Like this is the actual position being taken by Packer fans. Like, he's not doing stuff. That's probably not good, right? <laughs> oh my goodness, who cares? Grow up. You don't have to do stuff to be great. You don't even need to do stuff. Like, who cares? Funny thing is, the one guy I was arguing with, his profile picture of him at the gym, like, taking a picture of himself, you know, all, you know, I would say muscled up, but he was not very large. But, you know, whatever. He works out in the gym. The funny thing is, he expects more of himself as a person with nothing to gain from actually working out, other than just personal goals and determination. He expects more of himself. He doesn't have a competition to train for. He's not trying to win Mr. Olympia. What's the point? A very good chance the dude's married. So he's not even trying to, like, prowl for the ladies. Why is he doing it? Don't know, because he wants to. But yet, he expects more of himself than he expects from Aaron Rodgers, who is trying to be the greatest in the entire world. At something. And the idea is, pff, he doesn't have to try, bro. Like, you don't need to try and be like, be good at stuff. It's unbelievable to me. Like, I expect more from my children than Rodgers fans expect from Aaron Rodgers. Like, hey, don't throw that crap on the floor. Put it back where it belongs. Like, dude, relax. It doesn't matter. It's just a toy. Calm down. Which, again, is why the whole conversation is stupid. And I really have a hard time believing that the conversations I'm uh, having with people actually have anything to do with what people actually believe and rather are just people defending a person at all costs. Could be wrong. Maybe they're just that irrational, but I struggle to believe that that's the reality. Again, based on the fact that the guy I'm arguing with expects more of himself. <laughs> that's how I know he's lying. Anyways, Austin did call back, but we'll call that his, uh, his one skip to the front of the line. We'll go back to the bottom and see what Steve in Alaska is doing. Hey, Ryan. AK hey, Steve. Hey. How's it all going for everybody? Hope you're doing well. Doing great. Doing well myself. Thank you for asking. Good. Uh, yeah. Uh, out walking, but the, the ground is clearing up. It's, we're, we're warming up. We're getting real close to the, the long day here. It, uh, another month and there won't be any, any nighttime left. But, uh, I was uh, listening to the show like I like I do on my walks, and I was thinking about this whole Rogers thing, and and you know the harassment that we kind of get from you know Bears fans and, and Vikings fans about aha, it sucks. You guys are dealing with all this crap with you know Aaron Rodgers, just like you dealt with with Brett. Ha 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 ha! So funny, you guys suck. And I'm thinking about it. And it's like, so you're giving us a hard time because we've had 30 years of outstanding quarterback play you know, with multiple. Uh, Pro Bowl or multiple uh, league MVPs, multiple Super Bowls. You know, we're in the playoffs. What? Three out of four years we make the playoffs, maybe more than that. And and you're going to make fun of us because we're struggling to get rid of the guy. Wow, that that that's got to tell you something about what you guys have had for quarterbacks and and football play for your teams. That it's funny that we've been excellent for 30 years and twice have had a deal with getting rid of a guy. Bummer for us. But, you know, I've, I'm uh, not going to get too much into the Rodgers thing because I know we're supposed to be at that, that hit point right now where supposedly the we're just waiting on the, the brass for the Packers and the Jets to figure out compensation. That's the last thing I heard is they were dealing with compensation issues. Um, so we should, hopefully we're close. We just got to figure out what we're getting for them. But, uh, it's, you know, it's funny to listen to. People giving us a hard time. Matter of fact, uh, on the counterpoint of that, the uh, the guy that does the uh, news and notes for Colin Coward, I can't remember his name, but uh, I guess he's a Jets fan, and, man, he's just crushed. 
<laughs> he's so yeah. he's so bummed that they're getting Rodgers because he can see it just like you know we see it here. The guy's done. It's the end of it. We're going to spend all this money for a guy for one year who's pretty well washed. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it. And I don't mind having guys give me a hard time because we've been great and we're sitting with another quarterback that you know what any of them would probably be pretty most of them would be pretty happy to have sitting on their bench wondering if he was going to become their next star because, you know, they got Mitch Trubisky and, and uh, what was his name, uh, Baker, Baker Mayfield. <laughs> right on. All right, three minutes is here. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Yeah, man. Um, I mean, I've I've had that argument, I don't know how many billions of times, but, again, it's, it's I have a common refrain, and it's something to the effect of, like, yeah, I'm really heartbroken about all these – um, games we've won, divisions we've won, how, all the times we've beaten the Bears. I mean, it's like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely devastated that we've been dominant for 30 years. And the only thing they've got is, well, two Super Bowl, two Super Bowl. Like, I, I'm telling you, it doesn't bother me. But, you know, again, like, w- would you trade with me? You would, right? Okay, so shut up. <laughs> and by the way, the, I, I think you said Colin Coward, but I've noticed Rich Eisen is, is very similar. First of all, I, I think Rich Eisen just hates Rodgers. So I don't, I don't think that he likes that Rodgers is coming over to his team in general. But he is like, in the little bit that I've seen of him, he seems beside himself at the idea that the Jets would actually give like significant compensation. And by significant, I mean like anything more than a conditional third. Again, I, I, have, I don't watch his show religiously, but just on the few snippets I've seen, it's like, there's no way. There's no way. Like, tell me it can't be true. Please, please, tell me. So it's, it is like a double whammy, because I, on one hand, I think he's right, and he probably does have some genuine conviction about how much we should be investing. But then on top of that, they're going to pay, they're going to overpay for a guy that you genuinely despise. I don't know that. I just, it's the vibe I get. Anyways, why don't we go ahead and take a quick break right here. We will take a break. We will be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights... You're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Hey, Steve up in Alaska again. And hey. Sitting, uh, finished off my walk and sitting here. I was listening to uh, your uh, review of Aaron Rodgers' McAfee interview. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know what I'm hearing? I'm, I'm hearing a man... Who's, who's suffering with some midlife crisis, who yeah. doesn't seem to know what he wants or where he wants to go because he's seeing the end of his youth, you know, and he's got... I mean, it, at first glance, it sounds like you're being harsh, but I actually think that's completely fair. Um, and I think even Rogers has kind of talked about that, you know. I mean, he, he's talked about the level, the amount of work he has to do to try to transition into this new era of life, you know, because it can be somewhat traumatizing to leave football at a young age you know, especially something so massive and, and to have nothing. Um, and, yeah, I mean, he's doing all these darkness retreats and he's doing ayahuasca to learn how to love himself and all this. I mean, it. I don't think it's completely unfair to say there's a level of midlife crisis going on. To be an actual grown-up man, 
having to take care of you know, real responsibilities. He's not a pampered, going to be a pampered football player anymore where, you know, people bring him water and. Oh, he's still going to have that. Swipe or wipe the dirt off of his shoes and make <laughs> sure he has snacks and make sure that his bathtub water is just warm enough. But uh, he's going to have to go out in the world and do stuff. That mixed in with, you know, like some fifth grade, you know, writing letters back and forth, wondering if that girl over there actually likes me or <laughs> she likes somebody else better than me. It, it, it's just silly, and, and it all seems so so less than mature than you would expect of a man that's about to turn 40 years old and yeah. has made hundreds of millions of dollars and his, you know, fame and fortune is set for the rest of his life. It, you know, it, it's it's just ridiculous. And it all even kind of goes into the whole leaving problem with him and, and Gute. It, it's, it's like they were both thinking about breaking up, but Gute started to get there first, and Rogers cried. <laughs> and so Gutenkunst backed off and said, okay, we won't break up yet. And then, you know, Rogers was happy because, well, no, we're not going to break up, even though he was already thinking about it. And then he gets ready to go do his thing, and he's going to come back, and he's going to break up with us. That's what he says in that when he was coming out of the darkness retreat. I was, I was pretty well set on retirement. That's breaking up with us. Right. But what happened was when he got out, he found out Gutenkunst was already planning on breaking up with him. And so now he's upset again because he's not the guy that's getting to do the breakup. He's the one getting broken up with. And he don't like it. It's childish. You know, and again, it goes to that midlife crisis thing. You know, he, he, that, that's the real problem with the guy. It's, it's not his play. It's, it's not, I don't even think his attitude so much with the team. It's his attitude towards himself. And he can't handle the fact that he's at the end. <laughs> he just can't handle it. And so he's having a little hissy fit, and he's going to keep having a hissy fit and make everybody else suffer around him because of it. Yeah, that's my thought. I'd like to hear what your thought is on it. Of course, I've been listening to your thought on it, but yeah. we'll hear some more. <laughs> All right, man. Take it easy. Bye. I always feel weird when I say things that I've already said, but it's like, well, you guys are asking. Well, allow me to uh, answer this in a different way. Let me get biblical with you for a second. James 1 8 says, A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's the impression I get from Rodgers. He's straddling that line, man. He's not all the way in. He's not all the way out. If we want to get biblical again, we could talk about his lukewarmness. Not calling Gutekunst God, but in Revelation it says, Because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And that's essentially where we're at right now. You know what I mean? It's like, it's time to move on, man. I'm not trying to draw exact parallels here. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's just That's where my mind's at for some reason. But, I, but I, I really do think it goes, like we were talking about, to, to his play and to his commitment to the team. And listen, I mean, it, it, it is an absolute grind. And I, again, I keep going back to bodybuilders because it is a complete commitment. Go, go, there's a documentary about Kai Green. Anybody that wants to defend Rodgers and, and his not wanting to do anything, not wanting to show up to OTAs, not wanting to play with his players, not wanting to you know go that extra mile to build chemistry with his... Go watch the documentary about Kai Green. I mean, there's probably a billion of them, but just that's the one I'm telling you to watch. Go watch what this man does. His entire life is bodybuilding. He doesn't have another life. He doesn't have friends. These guys don't drink alcohol. They've gotten it out of their life because they can't. Well, I mean, I shouldn't say all of them. Obviously, Arnold did back in the day, but I'm, I'm talking no drinking, no drugs, no partying, no parties, no pizza, no nothing. When you wake up, when you sleep, when you eat, how much you eat, what you eat, every single moment of your life, 365 days a year, comes down to this obsession. That's, uh, what's his name? C.T. Fletcher, my magnificent fe- um, obsession. Every single moment, every step I take, everything I do, and these guys are eating food that, that is disgusting. And, and if you try to tell a bodybuilder or something like, well, I don't really like the way that tastes, you are going to get shredded. You don't eat for taste, you freaking pansy. Put the food down. And you're going to put it down again and again and again and again and again. You're going to eat it every single day. And by the way, you're going to eat like seven times a day. You're going to eat until you feel like throwing up. And you're going to do that every single day. And you're going to go to the gym and you are going to freaking grind it out. This is what people are putting themselves through to be the best in the world. And I have to sit here and freaking explain to people why maybe for like a week... In the off season, you can take a break from your freaking vacation and work out with some guys. And 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 I'm I, people are like that's absurd. 
that he would be asked to do something like that. The man's on vacation. I mean, come on. It's not hard to see why some teams are at the top and some teams are not. You want to know why the Chiefs stay up? That's why. And it's not, I'm not saying, well, it's because Pat Mahomes did this in the offseason. No, that that is a symptom of a larger, um, a, a, a larger piece of who he is. He's the kind of person who gets his receivers together and they work out in the offseason. And because I see that, I can see, I can follow that back to other things in your life. Likewise, if you're not doing that, I can probably draw some other conclusions because it is a very minor, minor thing that you could potentially be doing that could have very large effects. And the inability to even do minor things when you're talking about trying to be the great, you want to be the great, pick any single thing on planet Earth that is even mildly competitive and tell me you want to be the greatest in the world. What's required? Go talk to actors and actresses that are at the top of their craft and ask them what they went through to get there. Go ask singers, guitar players, the hours and hours and hours. Every single freaking day since I was six years old, I've been playing this freaking guitar. That's how I got. To, you think Stevie Ray Vaughan just like plays once a week for like half the year for 60 minutes? 60 minutes once a week for about five, six months. And then Stevie Ray Vaughan was just Stevie Ray Vaughan. Jimi Hendrix is just Jimi Hendrix. Steve Vai and Joe Satriani, like those guys, yeah, that, it's like, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. Neil Peart, the, the drummer. Yeah, he barely drums. Not a big deal. It's a freaking obsession. And if you're not, you know, and if, if you're not all the way in, then you're out. And that's the way it needs to be with these teams. And I know, again, the NFL is all about, like, let's just minimize the amount of work that is required. And they love that, right? A lot of these guys, especially, let's be honest, the Rodgerses, these are the guys who are like the big, like, union. We need to less work, less this, less that. It's too much of a strain on our bodies. And, all, and it is. And you know what? You think, uh, go look at Ronnie Coleman and the strain that went on his body. He wasn't ignorant to the risks. He was willing to put himself through it to be the greatest in the world, though. And so, yeah, the, the requirements are much lower now in terms of what you have to do because of all these negotiations that have gone on, which means if you want to be the greatest in the world, you're going to have to do it yourself. And there's a lot of people out there that are doing it. There's a lot of guys like Rashawn Gary that are just out there putting in the work. It's not a requirement, but I'm going to do it. And again, we're getting reports now, whether you want to believe them or not, but Aaron Rodgers showed up to camp completely out of shape last year. That the reason I choose to believe it, aside from the fact that everything else in that report seems to be seemingly true at this point, is because it just follows in line with everything else I'm seeing from the guy. You know, I mean, if if, if he's out there working with his guys, you know, if, if if Jordan Love showed up and they were like, he's out of shape, that would be kind of like surprising. It's like, really? We've seen the dude working. Like, that's surprising to me. It doesn't surprise me with Rodgers. He goes on the Pat McAfee show and talks about, you know, he's he's out doing ayahuasca and darkness retreats and he's hanging out with celebrities and dating new young girls and whatnot and doing whatever and you know i mean there's some physical activity he plays golf and stuff that'll they don't get the heart rate up a little bit occasional like charity event thing and i'm sure he does some exercise you know some exercise and being in nfl shape especially when you're almost 40 years old kind of a big difference so yeah I, i'm i'm with you i think he's just going through some stuff i think he you know i mean I think when a player gets to the point where they're spending months every year trying to decide if they should play, I mean, it's the same thing that happened with Favre. When he started contemplating retirement, was it really, were those years the best years for Brett Favre? No. You say, well, he was really good with the Vikings. Right. He was good with the Vikings because Brett Favre is just like Aaron Rodgers. The reason he was good with the Vikings is because he was pissed off at the Packers and his entire life was dedicated to beating the Packers. And you know what? I bet he was in the weight room. I bet he was putting in extra work. I bet he was doing it because he had that magnificent obsession. And maybe Rodgers will too. He'll be obsessed again. And good for him. Whatever it takes to get you obsessed and to get that fire back in your belly, to love something again, that's cool. But he wasn't doing it here. He wasn't. God, I love Twitter sometimes. I have a love-hate <laughs> relationship with it. But now, oh God, now I'm seeing Jets fans on Twitter like saying, like, Oh, we're not giving up uh, that much. We're only going to – maybe we'll trade the 13th for the 15th and Aaron Rodgers and uh, and no other compensation. They Oof. got so cocky now that they hear that he wants to go there. 
not realizing that that's not good for them. They're going to work out something where we're we're going to get some compensation for him. And, like, not that long ago, I remember Jet fans just about willing to give an Aaron Rodgers a job just to come over there and play. Like, how quickly their tone change <sighs> is insane. Let go. <laughs> well, the, the funny thing is it really takes a lot of pressure off of us, you know, I mean, if it's like, if we're saying, I think we're going to get a first and a second and a player, and they're like, no, you're only going to get like two seconds and uh, like a low level player, then it's like, you know, I, I might lose this battle here. I don't, I don't really know. And I, I'm not saying that's what I think we're going to get. I have no idea, but I'm just making the point. Like the, the bar is so low for like, again, Rich Eisen. He's like, dude, this guy's worth jack squat. Like, we're, there's no way, right? Like, we're not getting anything. And Pat McAfee's dug all the way in. Like, the Packers have no leverage. They're not getting anything for him. And, um, you know, all, all the Jets fans, are, no, no way. They're not getting anything. And it's like, I mean, I guess we'll see. But you guys set the bar so freaking low. Like, if we get anything over, like, a third-round pick, period, not like a third and something. Like, if we get more than just a third it's pretty much just in your face. Like, like, here you go, receipts all day long. Because, I mean, you know, like you said, it's just there's so much cockiness and arrogance about something that just seems so <sighs> unlikely to be correct. And I, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's a third and nothing. I doubt Goot would ever agree to that. Again, freaking no, and he can retire or do whatever he wants to do. I don't care. But, um... I, again, I, yeah, it just, it's wild. And and I haven't really, like, delved into that much, which is why I'm always, like, taken off guard when I hear stuff like that. Like Pat saying the Packers have no leverage, and, like, I, I, occasionally. I think the vast majority of things that I've heard are the Packers have the leverage, but occasionally I'll see something. I, I saw something on Reddit. I don't even remember who it was, but they linked an article, and it had to do with the fact that if, if the Packers don't get a deal done before the draft, then the compensation will be less. It's like, well, it's kind of a weak argument. Um, I don't think Brian Gutekunst is going to, you know, panic about something so minor. And beyond that, that's not even true. You know, value is value. That's like saying, you know, I want 200 bucks and I would like it in, what, you know, a $100 bill and two fifties. And it's like, well, if you don't get this deal done before the draft, we don't have $100 bills. It's like, okay, then I guess we're doing 450s or whatever denominator. You know what I mean? You can still get the same value. You probably just get more, you know? Like instead of a first, it's a first and a second or something. I don't know. It's just more. The value doesn't go down. That's absurd. The value only goes down if we're saying the exact same compensation happens. And even that is not actually down. Again, this is the psychosis that is the value goes down next year. It's not actually less value. It's less perceived value which is incorrect. In my estimation, the value would actually go up if we get more compensation. But regardless, the actual value will be the same because we're going to get more compensation. The value is the value. This is what we want. And if you're not going to give it to us this year, then we will just come up with new terms for next year. And you will be giving up. And honestly, that hurts the Jets more. Because again, you know, you can be a moral victory that we didn't have to give up anything this year if you want. But it just means you're going to have less picks because we're going to have to take more picks from you. And, and a, a higher overall actual value from that draft class than what we would have done if we would have just let us do this year and next year. So in, in reality, it isn't going to end up being worse for the Jets. As far as leverage, I don't really think it moves the needle all that much. Aside from, you know, if Gutekunst really, really like has a plan for pick 13, like they want to trade up or they, they know what player they think they want to target or something. But again, he's not going to allow that He's not going to allow the Jets to have leverage, which is to say he's just going to continue to not blink. And the Jets are going to say, well, you know, you better hurry up. And it's like, I'm not, I don't care. We don't need it to get done. He'll just, he's just going to lie, <laughs> even if he wants it, because the timeline ultimately is hurting the Jets a lot more than the Packers. So is Nico here. Hey, uh, Nico. Can you just imagine? Let's say we're six games in the next season and Jordan Love looks really good. I mean, we all, we all, want to be we all want to be optimists. I think he's going to be good, but I don't really know. He has a very he – well, he's only thrown, what, less than 100 passes, you know, in three years. But what, can you just imagine 
let's say halfway through the first, through next season, he's doing exceptionally well. He's got great touchdown to interception ratio, and maybe even by then, people are like, you know what? The Packers got another one, yeah. another really good quarterback. Can you just imagine what every Bear fan oh. is going to be thinking? I mean, that alone would be just icing on the cake. I want a good team. Dude, darkest – it's funny. They're talking about the darkest day in Green Bay Packers history because Rodgers left. It will be the darkest day in Chicago Bears history. If Jordan Love comes out, like let's just say week one, and just freaking lights it up. Like I'm talking – Four touchdowns, no picks, just a billion yards. I mean, it's just, it's it's going to be, that's it. Like, the, the amount of freaking despair that, they, that there will be. I mean, it'll be the Vikings and Lions and, and a lot of other people, too, who are just sick of the Packers being good all the time. But Chicago Bears fans in particular, you know, they're so excited about Justin Fields and, like, we got it this time and it's actually going to be a thing and we're going to win the North, which is freaking diluted to begin with. But that's the moment when they will realize not only is it not going to happen now, but it's going to be probably another 15 years of absolute freaking misery. You think about 15 years, how old am I going to be? I'll be over 50 years old when we move on from Jordan Love. You know freaking awesome that would be if we could just basically reset hit the reset button on the aaron Rodgers era and just be like dude that was fun it was should we do that again yeah it's like you ever you ever watch a movie that's really really good probably this might not have ever happened to you but like it's it's so good and let's say you're hanging out with your friend and i'll use that as an example because this is the situation i was in and it's like what do we do now and it's like do you want to watch it again it's like yes i do Aside from probably watching 300 on a loop several times, the one that immediately comes to mind is the first time I watched Man on Fire. It was me and my half-Mexican lawyer, Blaine, and um, I think we were in my apartment in Whitewater. I don't exactly remember, but um, we had like a bunch of movies ready to rock and roll. I think they were Denzel movies, and we watched Man on Fire, and it was my first time watching it, and it was just one of those where you just, I don't know, like we could watch another movie, but I know that if I had to choose the best possible thing that could happen, it would be to watch that movie again. That's what it would be like in a weird, stupid way. Like, that was awesome. Let's just do it. Like, you want to do that again? Like, another 15 years of just being awesome? Like, yeah, let's do it again. Why not? And the other great thing is, again, if we're, if we're just using Rodgers as the standard, he doesn't need to be Pat Mahomes or Joe Burrow, right? Like, Aaron Rodgers was the, if we're using passing, um, Passing grades via PFF, he was 10th. Hilariously, pretty much that entire draft class, the 2020 draft class, is inside the top 10. Justin Herbert was 9th. Tua was 5th. Jalen Hurts was 4th. Joe Burrow was 1st. That's all of them, minus Jordan Love. (laughs) He's the only one that hasn't had an opportunity yet. I wonder if he'll be in there. But think about that. What if he's just as good as Tua? There's still questions about Tua. Like, is he the future? Like, I'm not really sure. He was the 5th best quarterback in football. 3,500 yards, 25 touchdowns, 8 picks, 82 uh, PFF grade, um, 81.4 passing grade. I mean, (laughs) if he's Kirk freaking Cousins, he was 7th. Tom Brady in a bad year was 8th. Justin Herbert this past year was ninth. Geno was 11th, you know? Again, he doesn't need to be Joe Burrow. What I want from him is to be kind of somewhere in that top 10. That's his job, and to work toward that number one spot. You just keep inching upward. Gutekunst's job is to make sure that we have a roster that is still a roster that I can look at and go, dang, we got a lot of talent. And then from there, the point of all of this is we need guys that give 100%. And that's how you win a Super Bowl. It's kind of that easy. (laughs) Good players playing good consistently, especially when it matters the most, means Super Bowl. Not automatically, but that's when you get back into that conversation of, you know, being the favorite or one of the top teams for the Super Bowl. I mean, crazy stuff happens, but this doesn't, the, the, the point is this whole thing doesn't hinge on him being the best in football, otherwise it doesn't count. Rodgers was the number one sometimes, but it wasn't like it was every year. He wasn't in 2022. He wasn't even in 2021. He was in 2020. 2019, he was seventh. 2018, seventh. 2017, 12th. Yes, he was injured, but he played somewhat. Not in 2016. Not in 2015. Uh, let's see. 2014. Yep, I know 2014 was a big one. Uh, 2013, no. 2012, no. 2011, yes. 2012, 
2010, no, 2009. This was kind of his, like, this was his range here. This is when he was truly at Aaron Rodgers' peak. He was second in 2010. He was number one in 2011. He was second in 2012, and he was only second to Peyton freaking Manning. Um, and that, that, that was like that three-year window where Aaron Rodgers was godlike. After that, it was kind of hit or miss. He was, he was always near the top, but there's a lot of guys that are always near the top. You know, he was fourth. You know who was fifth? Josh McCown <laughs> in Chicago. You know, 2015 was like that first year where it was like something's a little bit wrong. He was 13th between Kirk Cousins and Tyrod Taylor behind Jay Cutler and Sam Bradford and Derek Carr, interestingly. So again, it's, it's, it would be unfair to say you got to be like the top quarterback every year. Because that's now we're saying you need to be better than Aaron Rodgers because he wasn't that. I think he was the number one in, in his long, illustrious career. I think, according to PFF, number one quarterback three times. Team, regardless. I mean, if Jordan Love is trash, but then our defense is great, it is what it is. But if he's that good, I can only imagine Bears Twitter will probably just shut down. Yeah. And I don't venture into that world like you do. Yeah. But I do live vicariously through you with Twitter when you talk about Bears fans. Yeah. They are going to all want to collectively jump off the earth. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> wow, I mean, that's going to be just, that will be the best thing ever. And uh, I can't wait for that to hopefully happen. So, hey, here's here's to uh, next year, happens in the season, all Bears fans wanting to uh, drink some Kool-Aid, you know, down to Central America or wherever the heck that did that thing. They're playing. Hey, Go back, go, and obviously I don't mean any harm to Bears fans, but, you know, they're Bears fans, and they're not that smart. I have to really spell it out for them. So, <laughs> hey, go back, go, and I can't wait for another 15 years of amazing quarterback play. Yeah, man. Well, it, it is a little discouraging that I say the most words on this podcast, and I still never have the best lines. Bears fans are going to want to jump off the earth. I, have, I haven't said anything better than that today. On that note, I think I'm going to wrap it up. I could squeeze one more in, but I'm kind of exhausted. Did did it over an hour uh, for tomorrow's podcast. I think we're going to call it. Uh, please keep calling in. You guys have a good one. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>